Okay. We've got a lot of good reading to do. We're at an intense point. Let's go for the home stretch. I left a picture of the Alcatraz Island up. You can see the 64 building sticking out just a little on that flat part. I don't know if you can see the flat part. <clears throat> Even with the flat part, the edge of the white building there, that's the edge of that long building. That's the 64 building. And then up towards the top there, below that stack, is kind of where the warden's house is. And that's where they are right now. And that's where Buddy Boy grabbed Moose by the throat last chapter and said, shut it or you die. Remember, Buddy Boy wasn't answering the door for Jimmy. Something was wrong. Okay. Um, chapter 32, The Good Prisoner. Same day, same exciting day, Friday, September 13th. I think she did that on purpose, Friday the 13th. Don't say a word. Not one word, Buddy Boy draws. It's only Buddy. <clears throat> buddy won't let anything bad happen. Buddy likes us. <clears throat> Ease up, Willy One-Arms, whiny voice. The cold lessens its grip around my windpipe. The cold hand lessens its grip around my windpipe. I take a big breath and a twist hard. The fingers burn into me like a taut rope. I can feel the tall, hovering frame behind me. The whispery voice. The three-fingered hand. It's seven fingers in a guard uniform, complete down to his shiny black shoes. Buddy Boy <clears throat> has one of Piper's hands twisted behind her back. Her other arm clutches the baby. Buddy Boy has a gun forced up into her back. Buddy? Our Buddy? He's dressed as a guard, too, <clears throat> in front of Willie, one arm, in a guard shirt and pants, but no jacket. No, cl He clutches Natalie in the crook of one wiry arm. His gun is in his hand, covered by an undershirt. Nat's face the other way as she can't bear to look at Willie. Her head jerks in small, agitated twitches, which startle Molly, who sits on Willie's shoulder. Quit it, Willie whines. Buddy, make her stop. The warden's kid brought the baby, Seven Fingers voice makes my skin crawl. Natalie is shaking all over, trying to spin herself free of the arm around her third throat, the gun jammed in her back. Natalie doesn't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that, says Natalie. Oh, I'm sorry, that was Natalie's voice. Natalie doesn't like that. I don't like that. But he smiles and like he can't turn off his lips, but his eyes are like points on barbed wire. What to bring the baby for, he growls at Piper. Just snap the baby's neck, seven fingers, whispery. Um, Bull Durham, breath in my ear. Buddy, tell him not to say that, I plead. Willie one arm tries to cross himself without loosening his grip on the still twitching Natalie. Can't do nothing to that baby, he mutters. I see a flash of the baby's eyes. He starts to cry. Piper squirms like crazy. Buddy has her tight. Buddy, listen to me. Buddy. Piper's voice sounds sure and strong. Don't do this. You're going to be in vaudeville, remember? You're good, Buddy. You are. Buddy slaps her head. Shut it. I can cover for you if you let us go now. I said shut it. I lunge toward him, but Seven Fingers squeezes my neck with his arm and grinds the gun in my back. The baby's cries are piercing now, as if he senses Piper's fear. Come on, buddy, Piper says. We're friends, right? Let me have the baby. I'll shut him up, Seven Fingers says. You can't kill a baby, buddy, Willie one arm whines. Not on the 13th. Then I see something out of the corner of my eye. It's Jimmy, the real Jimmy, coming up the back way. I need to get his attention, but how? I think about throwing a rock, but I can't get near one with Seven Fingers' arm around my neck. Besides, then Seven Fingers will see him. I have to do something quickly before he. It's too late, but Jimmy's already inside. Will Annie and Teresa suspect something when we don't come back? No. I just say I was taking Natalie home. The figure Piper went down to the 64 building with me. Take the baby. Do something with him. Buddy Boy tells Willie one arm. Buddy's arm snakes around Natalie, Willie, and Willie lets go. Natalie squirms. Buddy Boy cranks his arm tighter around her neck. Only 40 minutes till the next count. Not going to blow my chances for a baby. Buddy, buddy, Willie one on ones. I ain't no baby killer. Yeah, so get out of here. 
Willy one arm takes off, the baby in his arm, his running steps almost silent, his body low to the ground. My brain is skittering all over the place. Adrenaline pumps through my body, making it hard to think. This is not a game. Buddy doesn't like us. Never did. That was his game. He could kill Natalie. I have to think of something. And then slowly it occurs to me. Buddy did, did his Jimmy imitation. That lord is out here, but now the real Jimmy is inside. If Buddy were to do a Jimmy imitation now with Jimmy in the warden's house, wouldn't they suspect something odd is happening? I ain't staying here, Seven Fingers says. Willie's got the boat key. You learn to swim all of a sudden, Buddy Boy barks. What make you think he's coming back? Where's he taking the baby, Piper whispers. No one answers her. Where is he taking the baby? Shut it. How do you do that, buddy? I ask my voice hoarse because how tightly seven fingers grasp my throat. Make your voice sound like Jimmy. Buddy boy flinches. Shut up, he says in his Jimmy Madaman voice. But wasn't loud enough for them to hear. Yeah, but what exactly did you say, I ask? Buddy grunts like he's not going to do it. But I know, buddy. He can't resist showing off. Moose, Piper... But he imitates Jimmy a little more forcefully this time as Willie one arms, dark silent form comes slipping back to us. I want to look at the window in Piper's room to see if maybe I can spot Annie, Jimmy, Teresa, but I don't dare. Let's go. Willie's out of breath whisper as he takes Natalie from Buddy and shoves her forward. Jimmy, Nat mutters. Jimmy Madaman. Get a move on. Seven fingers, hot tobacco breath fills my ear. Three men, five arms, five Five arms, Natalie mutters as the wind begins to howl. That's right, Nat. I make my voice sound reassuring as possible. If she pisses a fit, they'll shoot her. Three men, five arms, no guns. No, Nat says. Seven fingers yanks my neck. Shut her up. Shh, like in the library at home, Nat, I say in a whisper. Zero, Nat mutters. Seven fingers crushes my windpipe. Shut her up, I said. Shh. Buddy Boy hisses, and Seven Fingers eases his hold, just slightly as we tramp down the silent path by the parade grounds around the 64 building. We're walking where guards are supposed to be. No hiding, no skulking. We're out in the open, hiding in plain sight. I try to think about what is happening, but the gun in my back makes my mind slip all around. Buddy Boy impersonated Jimmy, hoping one of us would come out. They needed hostages. They weren't counting on Natalie and the baby. The biggest problem now is time. At 4.30, they're due back at the cell house. What time is it now? I have no idea. How can I slow them down? I don't know that either. It's so foggy we can hardly see. People can't see us either. Part of the reason they chose today to make a break. The other reason was the party. Nobody's thinking about the cons right now, and they know it. The cons have guns wrapped in shirts pointed in our backs, but they're walking close and holding them low. It doesn't look suspicious. Seven Fingers is whistling the same stupid tune Trixel always whistles. Buddy has toothpicks in his mouth and my father's jiggy step. To all of Alcatraz, it looks like a couple of families out for a stroll. How close do you have to be to see this isn't my dad? In this fog, extremely close. My heart beats so loud in my ears I can hardly think. We need to run into someone smart, but everyone smart is at the party. There must be a way out of this. The sergeant will know. He has to pull each card before we get on the boat. He'll see. Zero, Nat says again. Shut her up, Seven Fingers says. A little conversation, my voice is high, is natural, is what I say. Shut it, buddy boy says. A little quieter this time, but like he's agreeing with me. I won one. For a second, this calms me. Maybe I can win another. What do I do? All I can think about is Nat's counting. She doesn't count nothing. She only counts something. Zero. Zero what? What has she been saying? Guns. There are three guns. They each have one. I can feel Seven Fingers' gun in my back. Even Willie at one arm has an elbow around Nat's neck and a gun in his one hand. I try to get a better look from them in the foggy afternoon. Buddy Boy has his gun pointed in Piper's back, but it's hidden. Why is he hiding the gun? In case someone walks by, he doesn't want to see the gun, right? If I can't see, how could Natalie see? 
How could she know there aren't any guns? She doesn't know. I can't take Natalie's word for this. What am I, crazy? I try to get a better look at the gun in Nat's back, but she's behind me. Head forward, Seven Fingers says. This hurts, but I can hardly feel it. How could they get three guns? What if they aren't guns? Wood could be shaped like a gun in the carpentry shop when a guard wasn't looking. Wood would get through the metal detector without setting it off. But they have a key. A key is metal, too. How'd they get that through the snitch box? <clears throat> no guns. Zero. The guard tower is above me. When we pass down by the dock, they have the best view of us. They've eased up on our throats now. If Mr. Madaman thinks they're guards, he'll wave us on board. But he'll know. Of course he will. When I look up at the tower, I can barely see. The fog is so thick it almost completely obscured the glass cage. We're coming up to the boat. Buddy Boy does the wave, a perfect imitation of my father. The bent arm, the toothpicks in his mouth. Where's the sergeant? The sergeant's always here. Mr. Madaman, please stop us. Mr. Madaman doesn't stop us. How could he? He can't see. Mr. Madaman's up in the guard tower. We start across the gangplank of the boat. Once we're on the boat, Willie One Arm has the key. That is what Buddy was talking about. He won't have to wait for the buck sergeant to pull our cards. He won't have to wait for anything. The gangplank sways. It's foggy. We can barely see the water below us. I'm walking carefully, quietly, as Seven Fingers and Buddy Boy want me to do. I'm a good prisoner. I do everything exactly right. <clears throat> it's safer to go along, easier to do what they want me to do. Two steps on. Three, four, five. If I'm wrong, we could die. But Natalie's never wrong. Not about counting. Not ever. Why am I doing what they want? No, I cry. My hand shoots up. I open my mouth. And a voice booms out from the deepest part of my chest. I yell, help! Chapter 33. Outside the warden's house. Same day. <clears throat> Friday, September 13th. Something cracks. A sound like splitting wood. The world spins. The boat deck is slipping out from under me. My legs buckle and a sharp pain goes through my skull. I try to hold on to myself. I can't lose consciousness. Can't go away. Nat needs me. Piper needs me. The bright spotlight shines on us. Blood floats out. Warm blood I taste in my mouth. The air is suddenly black with flies. Swarms of them buzzing everywhere. Janet Trixel's voice booms through the bullhorn. Stop! They don't have guns, I shout as loud as I can. The second strike is harder. My knees buckle. The alarm bell blares, splitting my ears in two. Then suddenly, Seven Fingers is gone. I sway from the abrupt release of his hold of the hold on my neck. I try to keep from going down. Buddy Boy, Willie One Arm, and Seven Fingers scatter, keeping up, leaping over us as the boat sputters to a start. Out of the fog comes the clatter of Janet Trixel holding a bullhorn running with Teresa. I hear the clip of something being thrown, and then I see Annie tossing stones, one after the other. She clobbers seven fingers right in his throat on his Adam's apple. She gets Buddy Boy in the back. Remember, she's good at throwing. Guards are everywhere. More guards. Real guards. Rifle shots from the guard tower pelt the bay. Seven Fingers jumps the buck's sergeant. Trixel thunders down the road, waving his billy club. Next thing I know, Nat's shouting to Trixel, No gun! <laughs> Trixel squints at her, unsure whether to believe her or not. She's right. It's not a gun, I shout as loud as I can. Darby vaults on Seven Fingers, who has the buck sergeant in a headlock. Let go, mother of God, let go, he shouts, <clears throat> his feet and his arms pummeling <clears throat> seven fingers. Seven fingers lets go, and Darby wrestles him to the ground, flattens him, and holds his neck. The boat strains against the rope, bucking and roaring as Buddy Boy guns the engine, trying to pull the cleat out of the dock. Buddy Boy and Willie One Arm are barricaded in the captain's apart compartment. The boat roars, the dock creaks. Mr. Bamini jumps on top of the captain's compartment and shatters the glass with his billy club. Buddy Boy grabs Bamini's hand and tries to twist the billy club out of it. More shots splatter from the guard tower. 
causing little explosions in the water. Annie pelts more stones, and then Buddy Boy comes out, waving his hummingbird handkerchief, a hummingbird handkerchief, in the air, but hiding his head in the guard jacket, his smiling mouth finally still. One arm tries to bolt. He heads straight for the side of the boat, like his plan to jump overboard, but Mamini is too fast. He grabs him and slams him to the deck so hard it knocks him out cold. Come on, my father says, his arm his arm hovering above Natalie's shoulders as he pushes me and Piper across the gangplank. Tears stream down Natalie's face. No guns, she whispers. My father's face is white as a flash of lightning in the dark as he herds Teresa, Janet, Jimmy, Annie, Piper, and me into the canteen. Piper is ranting, her words slur. She grabs hold of my dad. He's my brother. I have to find him. It's okay now, sweetheart. My father makes his voice out. You don't understand. They took the baby. What? Moose, you're bleeding. He's, he's next to me now, his fingers probing my head. He rips the sleeve of his shirt and dabs the blood with it. We got to get you to Doc Ollie. My brother, Piper begs. The baby, please. Janet Trixel still has the born bullhorn and a look of stunned exhilaration on her face. She and Teresa are holding hands as they huddle together with Annie and Jimmy. I'm okay, Dad, but Willie took the baby. On the boat? No, up top. Piper's face is inches from my father's. You have to help me. Exactly where did you last see the baby? Outside the warden's house. Willie one arm took the baby, Nat echoes. Oh, Nat voice. That's Nat. Willie one arm took the baby. One baby. Willie one arm. One. Where? We don't know where. We'll send someone up there. We'll find him. His voice is calm again, but his eyes toward the phone outside Mr. Cocconi's door. I didn't. I didn't want him to, Piper says. Of course you didn't, honey. Of course not. My father reassures her as he leaves to dial. Officer Flanagan here. The Williams' baby is missing. Topside, Alcatraz number 301. Willie one arm took her during the escape attempt, last seen outside the Williams' house. What direction did he go? My father leans the door, asks me. Towards the cell house. North towards the cell house, my father reports on the phone. Take me. I have to find him, Piper lunges on him. My father tries to unwind her arm from him. Honey, I think it's better if you... Piper starts shouting. No, he's not your brother. Calm down, my father says. Moose and I will go, Piper's voice is as tough as my dad. We'll all go, says Annie. We're on lockdown, my father says. We on lockdown, my father says on the phone. Annie, you stay put. You understand? You're in charge down here, my father orders. And then into the receiver, he shouts, send the truck. A crowd is formed around us. All residents, stay in your apartment, please. All residents, Bimini commands. Teresa, Jimmy, Annie, Janet, you stay here. You understand me? My father's tough voice. I don't even recognize it. He looks at Piper. You're going up top. Moose, I want Ollie to see your head. Nat, you're with me. We're going to find your mom. He squeezes her hand. A quick squeeze. That's all Natalie can tolerate. What a trooper you are, he whispers in her ear. Natalie's a trooper, she says, her face glowing. When the truck appears out of the smoky fog with Trixel in the driver's seat, we pile into the cab. The door shuts and my dad hops on the running board. Got the whole island looking for him now. We'll find him. Don't you worry, my dad tells Piper, who's seated by the window. The truck lurches forward, straining as it heaves up the hill. When we get up top, the warden is there. He wobbles towards the truck door, opens it with a trembling hand. Piper falls into his arms. My little girl, he says. His voice is choked. He can barely speak. The baby, Daddy. The baby, says Piper. Baby, Nat digs her chin. The warden looks on. We'll find him. He doesn't sound as if he really actually believes this. He keeps his arm around Piper, protecting her, keeping her safe, as the guards fan out, spilling out of everywhere, searching more guards than I even knew we had. In the hustle and chaos, the sweep of the big spotlights from the guard tower and the bullhole commands, I shadow my dad, sticking close like I'm a kid again. Mr. Bamini directs the traffic and relays the warden's orders through his bullhorn. Doc Ollie is half running to the warden's house. There's Ollie. Let's get you two inside. But when I look around, there's only me. 
Natalie, she was just here, I tell my frantic father. My head's beginning to spin again. You go inside the warden's house. I shouldn't have had you out here in the first place. No, I can help. I know where she'll go. Where? I try to pretend I'm Natalie. She wouldn't like the commotion. She'd go somewhere outside the noise. By the way, I went to another chapter. It's called The Boss, chapter 34. Obviously, same day. Um, where would she look? Around the back of the cell house. I head in the direction I saw Willie one arm take the baby. I have no idea beyond this, but I don't want my dad to send me inside. I run as fast as I can, my father's thundering footsteps behind me. I'm running like I know where I'm going, when all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see a flash of Nat's blue dress disappearing inside the hospital entrance of the cell house. Was that her? Seems unlikely. My legs slow down. No way, because she could get in there. My father's sure about this, but I keep going. Moose, my father's voice. I saw her. Moose, stop. But the door is open, and down the corridor, past where a guard is conked out on the floor, I'm running all out, my feet pounding on the floor. I see Nat in her blue dress, standing in the corridor. Natalie, my father shouts. Piper's little brother, the tiny baby, he's here. And Capone has him in his arms. Baby, Nat says, looking towards Capone's cell. Oh my God, the baby's neck is broken, snapped in two by the raw power of Al Capone. No, the baby is sleeping. He has his eye closed, snuggled up in the crook of Al Capone's arm. He's rocking him gently. Nat is outside Capone's hospital cell. Capone is inside with the baby and the door is locked. How did the baby get in there? My father stops. His eyes dart between Capone, the baby, and Natalie just taking it all in. Capone whispers, Did you lose something, boss? Don't hurt him, my father's, my father's voice says with a shake. I'm not going to hurt him. I've been rocking him for close to an hour now. How'd he get in there? Molly, whis Nat whispers, pointing to the tiny mouse sitting on Capone's bed. Natalie followed the mouse, Capone smiles. Smart girl you have there, boss. The mouse took off. Went to found some food, I guess. But she came back. She's taken a liking to me. Everybody likes Uncle Al, you know. The baby, my father says. How did the baby get in there? Capone smiles, a very sly smile. Moose, pull that bar. The one there. He directs me to the bar with his chin. Slip it out gentle, and the next one over, too. I grab hold of the bar he means, and as soon as I do, I feel it give. A two-section, two-foot section pulls out in my hand. A neat square appears, chest size, big enough for a man to crawl through. You got it, boss, Capone says, still rocking the baby. He hands the little bundle through the opening to my father, tucking the baby's blanket under my father's arm. What the heck, my father says. Cuddling the baby more awkwardly than Capone, the baby begins to cry. Just doing a little bit of babysitting, that's all. Rock him a little. Come on, he needs it. My father ignores this. How did the bars get cut? They ain't toolproof up here. You know that. Who did this? I did nothing. But I might have seen somebody working on them with dental floss and cleanser. Dental floss and cleanser cut anything. Did you know that? Might have seen? My father asks as the baby cries. Been a lot of activity here tonight, in case you missed it. Hard to know where to focus your eyes, is all. You'll have to do better than that. Capone coughs. Hey, I got three more years, and I got my own son. What's his mama going to tell him? I pull a stupid stunt, get myself locked up for the rest of my life. I know a bad plan when I hear one, but also, I'm no rat. That's not going to cut it, Al. Capone looks at the baby my dad is holding. He was sleeping with me. He's crying with you now, boss. Who was involved? Didn't see no one up close. My hindsight ain't so good. What in the name of Peter and Paul? Trixel's boots pound down the aisle. Beats the life out of me, Darby, my father tells him. A trooper. I am a trooper, Natalie says. Trixel very proudly. Trixel's What is she saying? 
she found the baby, I tell Trixel. That ain't possible. She sure did, Darby, my father says. I'll be guard-darned. She's the one who told me they didn't have guns, too. Trixel looks at Nat. A flash of surprise in his eyes. He turns the convention to a capone. Bars cut? Yep, says my dad. Baby's okay? Seems fine. Rock him a little, says Al. I don't like to hear him crying that way. What happened, 85, says Trixel. Didn't see much, officer. Busy as I was babysitting and all. Trixel eyes the opening. I'll get the key. You can't stay in that cell. Don't see why not. If I was going to leave, don't you think I'd have hightailed it out of here already? My father ignores him. Isn't that right, Moose? Capone nods to me. Don't talk to him, my father says. Boss, he's a good boy, your Moose. I wouldn't go getting in the way of that now, would I? Capone eyes are hard, challenging my dad. Trixel comes back with the key, and the doors clank open again. I've had enough of your shenanigans tonight, 85. Put you in the hole. That ought to help your eyesight. It's going to be 2020 when I'm done with you. The hole? That ain't fair. I've been babysitting the warden's baby. I should be getting good time for this. He shouts as we walk out. My father shakes his head. Not sure what you do with a guy like that. He does good things, but then he goes and does bad things on top of them. My father says, as he tucks the blanket around Piper's little brother. Come on, let's get you home where you belong. Thursday, September 19th. Next chapter. We're close to ten more pages. Right after the escape attempt, there's a euphoria that envelops the island. Everyone from Warden Williams to Darby Trixel is amazed what seven kids were able to do on their own. No one can get enough of the story, demanding we all tell our version again and again. My parents are practically bursting with pride because of what I did and because of Natalie. Not only did Natalie exactly understand what was going on, but she figured out something I did not. The fact, this very fact, had given us hope we didn't have before. Natalie is getting better. Maybe not in the dramatic way my mom thinks she is, but better for Natalie. How did it happen that three convicts came so close to escaping the world's most secure prison? Slowly the pieces fall into place. May Capone delivered the boat keys on the island wrapped in her handkerchief. Remember? Teresa saw it dropped and then it was gone. A convict swept them up with his push broom and slipped them into his pocket. The keys came from an officer on Angel Island. Our boat is owned by the army, and someone on Angel Island also has a key. Capone helped out his hospital cellmate, Seven Fingers, but he did not try to escape. He was smart enough to know that the escape was poorly planned. He wanted no trouble with the guards, who have the power to extend his sentence, or with the cons who would kill him if he didn't contribute to the escape. So you say he had to play both sides. He got May to bring in the keys to the boat. He played the banjo every night to mask the sound of seven fingers sawing the bars with his floss. And he conveniently got behind his guard shoe shine service so he had two pairs of guard shoes in his cell. One for Buddy and one for seven fingers. One arm stole a pair of the warden's shoes which were three sizes too large. Each morning we wake up and find out something else. We still don't know how seven fingers got out of the cell house. No one knows how he got that key. My dad says we may never know. It all seems so exciting, and then one day it isn't. That's the day we find out the warden thinks the con had help from the inside. The escape, he says, could not have ha ha happened without the aid of one of us. Then my father, Associate Warden Chudley, Trixel, Madaman, Bamini, and every other officer not, duty, not on duty is called to the wardens for a meeting that lasts all day until the wee hours of the night. One by one and in groups, every man on the island is personally grilled by the warden. More meetings go on for days, and when my dad comes home each night, his toothpick box is empty, and he has deep furrows on the side of his mouth. He and my mother close the door to their room and whisper well into the morning. I go into Nat's room, stand outside the door, and even sneak into the secret passageway, but all I hear is muffled mumbles. No one knows what's happening now. 
Natalie, who was supposed to return to the Esther P. Marinoff School the night after the escape, is still with us. And when I ask my mom why Nat hasn't returned to school, she evades my questions with a tight-lipped smile, giving no inkling of what's going on. Finally, when I can stand it no longer, my father agrees to talk. There's some debate whether should be Natalie should be included in this discussion, but in the end, my dad decides that Natalie has actually earned this right. She's allowed to sit in her favorite spot on the floor, flipping the pages of her books. It's as if Natalie has earned a place in our family she didn't have before. My father paces and he picks up a box of toothpicks from the coffee table and he moves it back. We're not going to get kicked off the island, are we, Dad? No. What did the warden say? What can he say? The past men worked at his house. It was his idea to throw that party, too, and invite all the, of his best guards. There's plenty of blame to glow, go around. What about Natalie? Is he mad at her? How can he be mad at her? She found his baby son. Even Trixel gives Natalie credit for letting him know Seven Fingers was unarmed. Of course, Darby being Darby, he waxed eloquent on the need for a full report to J. Edgar Hoover until Madaman pointed out that right now, in his own living room, was a bar spreader being used as a carnival pole. <laughs> it's the centerpiece of Janet Pixie Merry-Go-Round, is what I said. So I've heard. Janet says she found it on the west side beach. Says it washed up on the island. I don't think that one's flying. The bar spreader's made of steel. It would sink like a stone, for one thing. Do they think Trixel had something to do with the escape? Nah, that's been ruled out. I think about how much I do not like Trixel. How he tries to trip me up whenever I can and how awful he is to Natalie. How sick I felt when he talked about how he treated his brother. If I open my mouth, I'm putting Natalie in jeopardy. But I wasn't brought up to let something, someone else take the blame for something he didn't do. Even if it was a nitwit like Darby Trixel. The bar spreader was in Natalie's suitcase, I tell my father. Jimmy threw it in the bay, but he can't throw to save his life. So it didn't go very far. Janet Trixel found it and decided to use it for her pixie ponies. She had no idea what it was. Natalie? Natalie's involved in this? My mom's voice rung tight. My father's gulps. Yes. Bottom drawer, Natalie murmurs. My father ignores this. His attention's riveted on me. How did it get in the suitcase? I don't know, Dad. You don't know? The question hangs between us. He clearly thinks I know more, but I've told him the truth. I have no idea how he got there. Moose, remember when you had that nightmare about 105? Was that after you found the bar spreader? Yes. And that's when the metal detector went off and Mr. Madaman thought it was because of the metal buttons. Yes, that fits. But why did you suspect 105? That's the part I don't understand. I just did. You just did. I think he, 105, I think he liked her. I mutter as the memory of 105 holding hands with Natalie comes back. My mom and dad stare at each other. Their faces look gray. My mom nods to my dad as if to signal him to go on. You were right to worry about 105. Sadie called us a few days ago. She said that Johnny J, Alcatraz 105, also known as Onion, worked as a gardener at the Esther P. Marinoff School. Apparently he faked references and they didn't know his background. They found out because they discovered a letter he wrote to Natalie. A letter? He wrote her a letter? Yes. What kind of letter? A love letter, he whispers. I look at Nat, who's concentrating on her button box. The letter said 105 loves her? It was a goodbye love letter. Isn't that right, Helen? It was said he was going back home to Portland for good. Everyone at the S2P Marinoff knows who he is now. They aren't going to let him anywhere near Natalie. The man lied about his references. Can't blame him for that. Hard enough to get a job with half the country out of work, and it's impossible if you've got a prison record. It's not going to be easy to prove, though, he put a bar spreader in Natalie's suitcase. We don't need to prove that. We won't be prosecuting, my mother. My mom snaps. Of course we will, Helen. Over my dead body. The papers get a hold of this, and what do you think will happen? Think this through, Cam. Crazy daughter of Alcatraz guard aids escape. 
is what I say. But the cons never got the bar spreader. Natalie didn't help the cons. She stopped them from escaping, actually. I know what she did. You know what she did, my mom says. But some reporter who wants a sensational story, what are they going to make of it? We can't have that much attention focused on Natalie. The warden kicks us out of here. I'll have no choice then. Why didn't you tell us about this, Moose? Same reason we didn't tell him, Cam. He was protecting us, just like we've been protecting him. He should have told us, my father says. Nobody can do this all alone. Nobody has all the pieces. We need each other. And what if Moose had told you? You would have run up to the warden in a heartbeat. We'd be off this island with no means of support, no way to pay for the Esther P. Marinoff school. You think Moose doesn't know all that? It wasn't the right thing to do, my father said. In a perfect world, you'd be right, Cam. Helen, come on. Look what happened here. The whole place fell apart. The bar spreader didn't cause that, my mom says. The bar spreader didn't do anything but prop up a seven-year-old's pretend ponies. Okay, but it could have. We got lucky is all. My mom leans in. Her eyes are large. Maybe we did, but like you said, there's enough blame to go around here, Cam. The warden is going to dig the deepest hole he can and bury this. He's going to see the light, just like Trixel did. Do you think he wants to give a report to J. Edgar Hoover that says everything fell apart while he was throwing a party? The only people who really were on top of the situation were the kids. Can you imagine those headlines, Cam? Kids apprehend escaping prisoners, I say. The kids. Nat, this is Natalie voice, sorry. The kids. The kids. We kids. We. Natalie mutters like she's practicing pronouns for Sadie. We need to tell the warden about this, Helen. We will do no such thing, Cam, Mom says. Helen, I can't live this way. We will tell the warden and we'll see what happens. But you're probably correct. So long as the press doesn't get wit of it, the warden will most likely let this go. My mom doesn't answer, but I think she knows she's lost this one. Her silence is consent. From now on, I want to know what's going on. You understand me, my father says? Natalie caused, Natalie caused a problem. Okay, Natalie mutters. Natalie caused a problem. Nat, I, Natalie, I, I caused problems. No, you didn't, sweet pea. You made me proud, and don't forget. My father walks over where I'm sitting with Natalie. He pats show shoulder awkwardly. We're a family of troopers. We'll get through this, Helen, the same we always do, by doing the right thing. Okay, a little bit more. I know it's going long today, but we got to finish it. We're like six pages away. The Kid's on the Rock. Now it's Sunday, September 22nd, three days later. Eventually things settle down. Whether this is because of the talk of my father with the warden or not, I don't know. But the sudden fear that hits our island disappears and everything goes back to the way it was. Associate Warden Chudley, though, Chudley is demoted. The warden finally realized what my dad and everyone else had known for some time. He's not up to his job. The biggest change, so far as I'm concerned, occurs amongst us kids. What happened when the cons try to escape changed the way we think about each other. Each of us contributed something important that dark afternoon. Janet saw Teresa running down from up top, and she came with her bullhorn. Teresa found out she's been right about the importance of May's hummingbird hanky. Jimmy figured out what he's going to do and snuck down under the dock and set loose his flies to swarm the cons at the right moment. Natalie's attention to detail helped her spot the fake guns and let me know about them in her own way. Annie made use of that perfect pitching arm. Piper discovered that deep down inside she might have it in, in her to love her baby brother. But it wasn't just that. It was what Mrs. Madaman said, too. About everybody disappoints you at one time or another, and you have to forgive people. That seemed to make a difference, too. At the parade grounds today, Annie throws the first pitch, and we all find our places. Jimmy is catcher. He still can't throw to save his life, but he taught himself to catch pretty well. Not bad at all. Teresa is shortstop, and I'm on first base. Janet Trixel is up to bat, and Natalie is the umpire calling the pitches, which she does with machine-like accuracy. And, of course, Annie chucks her perfect pitches over the base one after another. Not surprisingly, Piper isn't here. Some things never change. After we're done playing, Jimmy and Annie and I are walking back down to the 64 building 
when I told Jimmy it's too bad he had to let all his flies go. He says, you don't care about the flies, Moose. I do, Jimmy. You try, but that's different. He nods toward Annie. Annie never liked the flies, and she told me right at the start. It's easy that way. This island is too small for pretending. I feel the slap of his words, and I want to tell him he's wrong. But he's not. So I say, sorry, Jim. He shrugs. He takes his glass off. Well, all sorry about something. What are you sorry about? Telling Scout about the secret passageway. Yeah, why'd you do that anyway? I thought you were going to tell Scout. I wanted to beat you to the punch. I was hoping Scout's opinion of me would, you know, be better. Rise above the status of, of dead girl, I ask. He grins into his glasses. I'm not sure which is worse. Dead girl or auntie? Or Annie. Auntie. Annie complains, shifting her baseball pants the way a guy would. <clears throat> Okie dokie is what I said, I told her. <clears throat> That's supposed to make me feel better? Not that I care. I've never been sweet on you, Moose. I always thought you were a slug. <clears throat> well, thank you, I say, looking across the bay. You're welcome, she smiles a little. I have no idea why my mother would say that. It couldn't be further from the truth. No offense, Annie, but your mom has some nutty ideas. She in her needlepoint. Moose, moose, moose. Don't get me started on that. My mom thinks you love needlepoint. It's hard to tell when he likes something and when he doesn't, Jimmy grumbles. I wish Jimmy would let up. Annie's big lips pucker like she's thinking about this. But that's what we like about him, too, isn't it? That he tries so hard with everyone. I'm glad Annie has said this. What's the matter with that? But then I remember walking onto the boat with Seven Fingers' arm choking my throat. One arm marching Natalie across Buddy dragging Piper. People say I was heroic for calling the help the way I did. But I don't. But I know how close I was to staying silent. I scared myself that night. I saw how much trouble I want. I saw how much I want to get along. But sometimes you have to make trouble. Sometimes making trouble is the right thing to do. Life is complicated. You'd think on a prison island with the bars and the rules and everything, it'd be clear. But it's not. Last chapter, Monday, September 23rd, the yellow dress. Nat is going back to the Esther P. Marinoff school today. She hasn't pitched a fit about it either. Of course, my mom has made sure her yellow dress is brand new clean, one with buttons. Sadie shows one on every time she's done something well. My mom is in the kitchen packing up the lemon cake to take along, just in case Trixel decides to sharpshoot in the bay like last time. Even though Trixel admitted Natalie helped apprehend the Carnes, he still isn't our biggest fan. I don't think there's anything Natalie could do to change his mind about that. Trixel's mind is made of stone. It doesn't change. It chips off here and there. Nat is smiling to herself and runs her hand along the buttons of her yellow dress. Good idea Sadie had there. Kind of like badges generals wear, I tell her. They look like they belong on the dress because Natalie has sewn them so artfully. New button, Nat runs her fingers along the bottom button, which is small and aren't ordinary, the kind sewn on a man's shirt. But when it comes to buttons, there's no such thing as ordinary for Natalie. It's like me in baseball games, I guess. No two are alike. I bet Sadie will give you a new button if you cooperate today, I tell Natalie. Nat shakes her head empathetically as if she wants to jiggle. New button, she points to the simple white button. Not that new. You haven't seen Sadie in two weeks. No Sadie. No Sadie? Mom put that on? No Mom. Dad? My voice squeaks. I can't imagine Dad threading a needle. No Dad. Moose. I didn't sew it on Natalie. Mom's just kidding about me sewing. No Moose. Who did it then? Good job, Nat answers, handing me a scrap of paper with the brown with the lines folded in half and the handwriting I've come to know so well. And on that little slip of paper, in Al Capone's handwriting, it says, Good job. Ding. All right, well, we went extra long today, but we had to just nail it. Thanks for enjoying this book with me. Um, the next book, Al Capone does my homework, um, is pretty exciting too, but you're going to have to do that one on your own. Um, Piper, she doesn't stop scheming. She's amazing. And, um, I'll give you one small plot spoiler, spoiler for that one. 
Moose's dad becomes associate warden. He gets associate warden Chudley's job. Good times. All right. Enjoy the new year. I'll be seeing you guys soon.